Welcome to you all. Welcome to Eden webinars titled Education in Time of Pandemic. Um, I'm Sandra Kuchina, I'm Eden President. I'm with you today as a moderator uh, from Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, Eden has started with this series of webinar as our answer to this situation in the world, which we are faced all uh, together with the uh, education which has to change suddenly from uh, teaching in classroom or blended more teaching to the fully online teaching and learning. And uh, Ethan has started this series of webinars and after two very successful webinars we had uh, previously, today we decided to provide uh, somehow collected answers, uh, collected questions and to provide answers uh, on them. Uh, we checked and reflected uh, on the issues and topics you have asked us during previous webinars. And today I have with me the panelists, people um, who will try to give their answers and their insights uh, or reviews uh, on, on these topics. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank people uh, who are behind the organization of this series of webinars. Uh, these are three people. Uh, I'm very happy to be on the board. Antonella Poche from University Roma 3, who is uh, Eden uh, Napstring Committee uh, Chair. Then Timothy Reed uh, from UNED Spain, who is Vice President, Eden Vice President for Open uh, Professional Collaboration. And Lisa Marie Blaschke, uh, who is um, uh, Chair of the Eden Council, Board of Council uh, of Fellows and also she's from University of Oldenburg in Germany. So each of them is in charge of one part uh, of one group of the Eden community and collaborating together, they try to uh, choose uh, the most uh, interesting and demanding topics and to find the most prominent experts to discuss on these issues. Uh, well, I hope you will find interesting uh, all our sessions. We record them and they are all available to you. And also we have the survey after the webinars, so you can always uh, give your feedback through them. And we will try to uh, put all the topics we find uh, that you need uh, and uh, want to be uh, talked about during our webinars. Uh, also, uh, in this session, you will see with that we have a chat where most of you have already uh, tried to talk uh, and send the greetings uh, uh, that you are participating. But uh, for questions, please use question and answer section and post your question there. We will try during the webinar to answer all your questions. Uh, for today's webinar, let me first uh, present my panelists. Um, I'm very happy to have them on a board with me. First of them is Don Olcott, Eden Senior Fellow and Vice Chair of uh, Council of Eden Fellows and also member of the Steering Committee. Don is in education for a quite long time, so I could talk uh, about all his um, uh, jobs and duties so far, but let me say that he's uh, more than 35 years involved in uh, education, in open and distance education, uh, leadership in education, and that he has uh, taught uh, and worked at a number of universities, uh, I would say, worldwide. So I think that we have really, really prominent experts uh, on topic uh, and on board today. Uh, the next person is Antonella Poche, whom I already mentioned previously. She's associate professor in experimental pedagogy at the Department of the University of Roma Tre. And uh, I know her for a long time, and uh, I'm certain that all these issues regarding pedagogical part uh, in education and how to teach uh, will be certainly answered in the best way by her. And uh, Last but not least, panelist is my dear colleague Lisa Marie Blaschke, who is a uh, director of Center of Lifelong Learning in Oldenburg, Germany, long time uh, member of Eden. Uh, we have been working for a number of years, and uh, I'm certain that uh, she can give you 
really uh, good insight about uh, ways of teaching, of um, pedagogical application of Web2 technologies, uh, self-determined learning, and so on. So uh, for today, I have my three panelists. We have decided to use uh, this panel uh, in a way that we prepared some topics uh, uh, around the questions we have collected uh, so far and uh, dividing them uh, uh, in these topics. So uh, during this session, we will try to give you some answers uh, on the topics we prepared, but also to take your questions and answer them as well. Um, at the beginning, we have found that there are a number of questions uh, dealing with online learning, we can say in general. So uh, this is the first, this is the first question, uh, uh, the first topic we have chosen uh, uh, to discuss. So uh, I would like to start uh, our session with uh, Don and asking him, uh, how do you, Don, see uh, the, the question, um, how to move to online education, uh, how to uh, make it uh, in a good quality way, and do we have time to uh, implement it in, in, the full, in full, or we are just uh, now dealing with how to survive at the moment. So Don, please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Sandra. Um, let me start first by saying uh, welcome and thank you to my fellow panelists. Secondly, let me say thank you and I think a virtual applause across the globe to our colleagues who have responded to this crisis. I think the, uh, I think the response has been remarkable and in some ways just uh, unbelievable the way that has occurred. And certainly Eden has been at the forefront of that, so that's been, uh, that's been excellent as well. <clears throat> what I'm gonna to try to do is sort of give you a framework maybe from which we can have our discussion today. And I'm, I'm gonna sort of start with the theme, it's about time. And I'm gonna start with sort of three myths and then realities and then go from there. So these myths sort of re uh, apply to teachers, to leaders, and into our field in general. Um, I guess the first myth, or at least uh, misunderstanding, is that you can be a terrific online teacher in a month. Well, I'm not sure that's true. Uh, my own experience is that it, it takes a much longer time. It's much more involved. We're probably looking more in terms of realistically at a year to really be comfortable at doing this. There's a myth about leadership that organizations have all the time in the world to decide if they're going to jump aboard now. There's a lot of futurists telling us that uh, we've finally arrived. Um, the brave new world is upon us. And uh, I think the reality is, is that most leaders are going to be faced with some very serious decisions in a very short time, um, and they don't have all the time. I think this is a unique opportunity uh, in our profession in which to really uh, assess whether or not your organization is going to uh, adopt digital online learning for uh, the future. Um, I think another point I'd like to make is that I think the game changers in all this is not just technology, it's also leadership. You know, as we travel through the next few months, it seems to me we're looking at three phases. The first phase is the emergency response phase. That's what we're going through right now. Everybody is responding. We're dealing with a national and international health crisis. That's what we have to do. Um, you know, the good thing is, is that people are becoming familiar with the technologies, what they can do. Um, equally, people are finding out it's not quite as simple to implement as maybe they thought uh, at the beginning. A second phase that I think organizations will go through is um, basically deciding what the future is in their organization. In other words, uh, are they going to, if they're a new organization, are they going to adopt digital learning as part of their organization? If they're an ongoing organization, are they going to expand? what they're already doing, perhaps a balance between face-to-face -face and online learning. And lastly, 
we'll have retrenchment and regression. Um, institutions that will say, we're not going to do it. We're going to go back to the status quo and do things the way we did before. Um, I think all three of those faces, if I were giving advice to leaders, is organizations to need to be thinking about those simultaneously. Um, and a final phase, I think, that, that we all go through in this field is, is sort of the embedding the new values and culture and vision of what it means to be a truly a digital online organization. And I would suggest to you that's talking, you know, three to five years to do that. My main point again here is that all these considerations, I think, for organizational leaders need to be addressed now. Certainly the crisis and the immediate response takes uh, priority, but I also think deciding and having discussions within your organization for the future of uh, where your organization is going and why it's going that direction also need to occur. So let me stop there um, and uh, pass it on to my colleagues. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'm now I'm going to move to Lisa. Lisa and uh, I that uh, this pandemic time is something short, that it's something uh, to be here for a month or so, but uh, at the moment it doesn't seem it will finish so quickly. So uh, how should organizations and teachers uh, respond uh, to this? And in continuation to, to, continuation to Don uh, uh, reply as well. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I don't think there's any easy answers. Uh, UNESCO just came out with a statistic recently that 89.5% of all learners uh, around the world are, are learning remotely right now. And I think that that's a, a key term to use as remote learning. They're not really doing online learning, at least the way that I've learned and practiced it throughout the years. Um, what they're doing is they're learning far away from, from the classroom. And so I think, um, I think, we need to frame it that way and look at it as being remote learning and remote teaching. Um, in order for it to be online learning, there are certain things that need to be in place. Um, and, and for someone, I think that's that's trying to approach it for the first time uh, and and trying to adapt. You know, the question was, do we have time to implement it? Well, we we have time. We have time to implement something. Uh, and as Ava said in her presentation last week, I mean, we have to do the best that we can with the time that we have available. Um, I've met with some different uh, instructors who are, are making the transition to online. Uh, here in Germany, um, most uh, universities will be giving almost all of their uh, instruction um, online over the next uh, semester. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's getting ready for that, trying to get ready for that. And, and I guess my advice would be not to try to overdo it. Don't try to do everything all at once. Don't try to recreate your face-to-face your, your -face, uh, classroom. Uh, in the online environment and and really focus on some key themes that you want to uh, to focus on and then and then build around those uh, within the online environment and we'll be going into that in a little more detail when we start talking about instructional design and the other themes that have been identified for this uh, particular uh, webinar so Antonella yeah thank you yes. thank you uh, Lisa I'm moving to Antonella um, Antonella, you have been working uh, as a teacher at the university who is not dominantly uh, online university. It's much more, I would say, traditional university. Uh, so from your point of view, uh, how your university and your teachers, uh, your colleagues reacted to this situation and what do you think how we should prepare uh, for, for this uh, situation and to provide good quality teaching and learning? Thank you, thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Um, I, uh, in my view, and from the experience I had these uh, these last uh, weeks, uh, we don't have to ask too much to ourselves. We need to uh, activate our our networks. Uh, we need to uh, to work closely with those who can uh, be of uh, of a support. Actually, we moved one course and in my, in my responsibility from one day to the other completely uh, online. 
And it was hard at the very beginning. It was a hard task to, to carry out, but the, in the end, we found the, the right balance. Um, having the help of, uh, of, uh, of the tutors, uh, the role of tutors in, in uh, teaching and learning online is, is, is fundamental, uh, is really important. Uh, with the help of tutors, with the help of other uh, colleagues uh, outside uh, the university who were involved and really uh, were, were uh, able to give an added value uh, to the course, um, with other uh, stakeholders involved uh, uh, to be involved in, in our in our courses to give different perspectives also to our students that was really uh, a winning point let's say so so in in the time of trouble we found uh, a way also to uh, innovate uh, what was our teaching and learning uh, offer Yeah, uh, thank you, Antonella. I would, I would uh, just invite our participants uh, to join with the questions in questions and answer part. Um, so please uh, share uh, your experience or ask the questions. Now is the time we have three people who are experts in, in this field and uh, they can answer you some questions or even or at least give you some suggestions how to solve some issues. So please don't be shy, uh, ask. Uh, while we are waiting for your uh, questions, uh, we will move on uh, with the next uh, uh, topic we have prepared. And uh, this is the issue of uh, accessibility, which we are facing as well uh, this day. Uh, so when we want to start with the online teaching, and um, find the ways and technologies and tools how to do it. We do, shouldn't forget that um, we have to think about our learners. Do they have access uh, to online uh, uh, teaching uh, uh, and online materials and everything? So how to handle a situation where students do not have access to internet or technologies? Uh, that's further expanding the digital divide and what kind of solutions are available to ensure ongoing education for marginalized groups. So uh, let's start with you, Antonella, uh, on this topic. Yes, Sandra, thank you. Um, has, uh, this is one of the toughest questions <laughs> because, of course, uh, we discussed this issue also with Abba last, last Monday. And it requires a strong effort from the various stakeholders again. Um, and governments uh, should be the first ones to uh, ask to support uh, and to help uh, where, uh, of course, the, the situation is difficult. In Italy, um, actually, they uh, uh, decided to give a strong uh, support to, to pupils, to students, uh, and to um, distribute uh, devices uh, to uh, the young uh, students who are not uh, able to have uh, um, computers or, or iPads or, or you know, uh, tablets uh, at home. Um, then, with these uh, um, distance uh, uh, limitations and being compelled to be uh, at home, maybe in one family there's one computer, or uh, and that one computer should be used by the whole uh, family. So again, uh, support from the government uh, uh, is absolutely necessary. Uh, other uh, possibilities are uh, given by agreements with uh, companies, with libraries, with museums, um, online and offline volunteers. Uh, the United Nations offer uh, different kind of uh, um, support uh, in order to limit also the, the digital divide. Uh, to provide the necessary skills to access educational resources. Of course, 
uh, open education uh, initiatives are again very uh, important and useful uh, to facilitate uh, uh, inclusion of different marginalized groups. We need to also to say that uh, we there are different kind of marginalization that we need to take into consideration. So um, the most uh, adaptable uh, solutions should be the ones to be favored to be uh, to be used. We have been carried out different researches, and if you are interested, if participants are interested, we we can provide with links to our to our findings and resources in different kind of environments and different kind of uh, um, situations where we provided um, personalized, individualized um, solutions. Of course from a technological point of view and from a pedagogical point of view. So, I don't know if I answered your question, but I can give yeah. more. Thank, thank you, Antonella. Well, um, finally, we are getting some questions from the audience. And they're quite long questions. Um, so, uh, before I'm giving the floor to, to Don to... to um, provide uh, more information on this topic of accessibility. Uh, maybe to choose the first questions we got today from Julia. She, she asked, would you recommend tutors for more personal exchange? Should be professor, uh, uh, should be professor lecturers or could they be at the earlier stage and could it be even students at higher semester or PhD candidates? So more <laughs> personal exchange with uh, students. So uh, maybe Dawn, you could try to uh, answer this question. May, may I, Sandra or? or? So, okay, uh, Antonella, if you want, you, you yeah. start. No, just, just a few words because we have actually um, experienced uh, uh, this issue and tutors are, as I was saying, uh, fundamental to um, a, a good success of any initiative online. There are different kinds of, of tutorship. Uh, and so as Julia mentioned in her question, of course, we need um, different levels of, of tutors. Uh, level, tutors that are not uh, uh, professors can be very much helpful in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, situation so that uh, students can be felt um, can feel they are, you know, able to 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 ask any question, to uh, to learn about uh, how to manage with the learning process in a very free uh, way. Um, other kind of uh, of tutors are the ones that are more experienced. Let's say so, PhD students or you know, young researchers uh, can be very help helpful. Uh, supporting with uh, with content uh, um, issues and with also uh, the study uh, of the topics for for the exams, for instance. So there are different levels there, uh, but different figures. Uh, the the more the variety, the better. That's my my view. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Antonella. Uh, Don, uh, I'm giving the floor to you. Could you comment uh, a little bit about accessibility? And then I will give you a question from the pool of questions. Um, well, I don't have a lot more to add to what Antonella said about accessibility. Um, I think we need to do everything we possibly can um, to reduce costs. We know from research in rural sub-Saharan Africa, for example, People are, uh, the poor are spending a disproportional amount of their personal income on technology, where the higher social economic groups are spending maybe 5%, the poor groups are spending 20%, 20% of a much smaller amount. So, you know, um, we need to remember that, that as much as ICDs are important, sometimes, in fact, they can, uh, you know, intensify embedded inequities that already exist. 
Um, so we need to do a better job, and I think Antonella touched on this, of bringing different groups together, um, working together in collaboration, and I think we need to particularly pay attention to rural communities. Um, it's a completely different environment when we go very rural as opposed to being in an urban area where the availability of technologies are uh, you know, more ubiquitous. Um, I think that's all I would add to that. Yeah, uh, just to continue, uh, because you, you touched this, uh, give your overview uh, on the possibilities. I have a question from you, from, from Claire. She says, university have been implementing online blended learning for some time, but now many schools, primary and secondary, are also needing to do remote teaching. Is there a resources set of links giving advice for these sectors? What would you be your recommendation for, for the schools uh, for doing uh, online learning? Are you asking me? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think um, to go on to go online to any of your um, K twelve associations, most of them are making um, those kinds of resources available right now um, for middle and secondary schools, and particularly uh, a particular. Um, Remote learning, online learning for K to six. Quite frankly, I think that's a whole nother area of discussion. It's sort of the, uh, just because we can doesn't mean we should. There's a lot of, you know, very strong reasons why third graders shouldn't be taking remote learning or online learning other than in games and those kinds of activities because they're still, they're still maturing. Their maturation and intellectual levels are not full, fully mature. So um, I, I would go to your associations um, around K-12, um, and there's lots of uh, curricula that's available uh, through these organizations. Um, I saw yesterday, I think the European Commission has just released a, um, a website where it has a whole range of materials and resources. I don't have the website right in front of me, uh, but it was posted, I believe, today or yesterday. So, yeah, I think there's plenty out there to uh, to find best practices for, particularly for high school and middle school. Thank you, Don. I, I can I can provide a little bit uh, insight from Croatia because uh, here in Croatia we have very successful project e-schools, and uh, now in this situation, uh, the schools uh, have started online learning. But uh, not only um, via uh, uh, computers, uh, it's also part of uh, learning is via television. So television programs are used uh, for learning for smaller children, K-12 especially, but also for uh, children uh, going to the secondary schools and preparing for Matura. They have part on the television and part uh, online uh, via computers in order to uh, ensure that all uh, have access, uh, same access uh, to all resources. So this is one kind of uh, 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 example. And I have heard that the uh, UK has uh, chosen our uh, uh, way of doing it and uh, they plan to do it via BBC uh, as well uh, as we are. So, uh, okay, I'm now moving to the next question. And I think, Lisa, I think you can um, answer maybe this question regarding accessibility. So we are still at accessibility, but we have also questions saying accessibility also means being accessible to learners with special needs and making materials accessible to all. How can we make online materials, material designers aware of this important issue? and teachers moving online as well. Please share your views. From my own experience working with uh, students with special needs, uh, it was having a student in my classroom for the first time that taught me uh, of, of what was really necessary to assist that student and support that student. Uh, within the classroom, I think when you're designing, uh, you need to think about, for example, um, if you're going to have video that you'll need to have uh, um, that you'll need to have subtitles uh, for, for students that are, are hearing impaired uh, for those, um, uh, and especially for those who are in, in hearing impaired, and transcripts are also necessary. Um, usually at the university, there's an accessibility office that will be able to support you, um, at least with that, within our university. Um, there's someone that can provide guidance. Um, 
you know, just a, one really simple thing that you can do is if you're including a link, don't embed the link. Make sure that the whole link is there so that the that the uh, learner can type it in if they need to. There's uh, a lot of different accessibility guidance available on the net, um, and uh, so you need to be also available of some of the SCORM uh, issues that are involved there. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, we have similar question regarding accessibility as well, but I think we have answered it. And um, let me say, let me see the questions. Um, okay, I'm opening these questions to uh, any of you who would like to comment. Question is from Zvia. Uh, some of you mentioned the need for more time in order to have a real change. What are the milestones you can see right now that are needed when an organizational leader decides to make that change towards digital learning transformation, uh, hence teachers and other employees? So uh, who of you would like to provide an overview on this, uh, on this question? Maybe I mentioned in, in my previous uh, contribution the idea that we are we are uh, we have a great opportunity to innovate and to change and this is uh, absolutely true uh, what we need also to find is is the courage to change perspective and so what we need to to teach uh, actually uh, his uh, um, a way of working together, of creating uh, the right teams, of exchanging uh, um, uh, skills and of uh, enhancing uh, different kind of skills in our in our students. Um, this would help also the 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 whole online process to be uh, to be successful. So we need to. Um, support critical thinking, um, uh, and cooperation, creativity, different kind of, of skills, uh, and to work all together to gain such 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 skills. This is, uh, I think, is is a change of, of perspective and an opportunity to change that we really need at, at the moment. But we need to be to be brave. <laughs> Great, yeah. Thank you, thank you, uh, Antonella. Um, I'm going to move now on the next topic uh, we prepared uh, because I see that number of questions are going into way of instructional design. So uh, we have uh, chose the question for instructional design: How do we find the right mix of synchronous and asynchronous uh, activities? How can we reduce time spent on computers from the point of teachers and students? And how do we encourage a social learning environment? So quite uh, wide uh, uh, topics. And um, uh, Lisa, I thought maybe you could start uh, opening uh, this topic and then we will move to the other panelists. Um, yeah. Sandra, I think it's it's challenging to find the right mix of synchronous and asynchronous activities, but um, it's important that you start small. And as I mentioned before, try not to recreate your classroom, your traditional face-to-face -face classroom within the online environment. If you're going to use a webinar or if you're going to use a uh, an audio uh, video, it's really important that uh, it's it's short and that's and that students can use that video and and view that video. Um, afterwards, so if you're having um, synchronous um, videos, try to keep it short. Try to keep it around 15 minutes per video, um, and and allow for discussion, questions and answers from your students, so that you can increase interactivity. The asynchronous part, I think, is where you'll be finding um, the most activity, where you'll where you can identify certain discussion topics that you want to have a, about perhaps a video that you've posted. Um, and so then use that to use the video then to um, and the asynchronous discussion discussion forums to explore the content a little bit further. Uh, and this also leads to the to the question that was asked about having uh, opportunities for uh, interaction amongst the groups. What we do within our courses is we'll set up a place right specifically within the course where students will have an opportunity to interact, to uh, to ask questions, to post videos, to um, you know make jokes. It's, it's their own little cafe where they can 
they can get together. Students will also create those kinds of environments outside of the classroom uh, where they can get together. Like these can be Facebook groups or WhatsApp groups. Um, and this is uh, often the case when students um, are online. They need to have that place that they can go to where they're not necessarily in the classroom and, and busy with the content at all times. Um, the other questions, how can you reduce the time spent at the computers? Uh, right now, that's really challenging because we are in front of our computers all the time. Um, I found for myself, just being able to just shut down and, and close the computer, close the door, walk away, uh, once in a while. And uh, if you can provide opportunities for students to do things offline uh, where they're not using their computers, try to in incorporate those kinds of activities into the, uh, into the classroom. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lisa. Maybe uh, Antonella, you can add uh, from your point of view how to organize it. Yes, of course. Um, as regards synchronous and asynchronous, uh, activities, we need to focus on the pedagogical model uh, that we want to implement. Um, there are different models that can be effective online uh, and they are all based on collaboration. Uh, it could be collaborative, cooperative uh, uh, learning, project-based and problem-based learning, collaborative knowledge building, um, we need to, f again, to find a balance, uh, a balance that uh, between asynchronous and synchronous based on individual work, on collaborative, on project-based. Uh, there are some activities, for example, that support, uh, for sure, um, those cross-sectional skills that we were mentioning before, so, for instance, discussion forums um, around a, a certain topic are those uh, activities that actually uh, support reflection and also the use of different uh, sources uh, uh, by the students. Uh, on the other side, synchronous activities are necessary to involve uh, uh, and to enhance social skills uh, and also oral communication skills. So we need to, to find a balance. Of course, each uh, teacher, each, each lecturer knows which is the, uh, the focus that is needed for, for uh, their, own, um, their own objectives. We always need to focus on which are our objectives when of course, thinking and designing our uh, our activities. As regards uh, reducing the time spent on computers, this is a hot topic, really. Uh, what we managed in in uh, our experience was that related to support um, uh, uh, activities uh, like those. Uh, foreseen in tinkering, for example, uh, the maker uh, movement that has, be, that has developed in, in tinkering uh, really produced different uh, ways of engaging students, but at the same time uh, making them work uh, not all the time at the computer. So asking students to make paintings or create objects, uh, having the visual uh, representation of what they have learned can be uh, really a way to stimulate them and at the same time limit their, their time uh, on the computers. Again, as regards tinkering, we have we carried out different researches and we published different articles and um, links to the open source articles can be available to the audience if participants are interested. Uh, if you are interested in tinkering, don't miss uh, the Exploratorium uh, of San Francisco that was uh, the first, the first uh, institution to start these kind of activities. So again, go to the to their website and they are offering different different activities also, especially uh, during this time of emergency. So I, I really suggest to go there and see what they offer. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we have some questions uh, pointing to the uh, specific subjects, like the exam 
exa uh, for example, the, the chemistry, uh, teaching English, uh, how to use, uh, how much to use technology, like uh, WhatsApp, uh, and so on. So uh, I saw the question that say uh, uh, it's much uh, going, it's go going beyond the technology. So um, we have this uh, issue saying at one point of view, uh, not to uh, spend too much time at the computer, but uh, for teacher and for students, it means to get acquainted with the new technologies, but also with the new ways of teaching and learning. So um, how to provide training to faculty and students to teach and learn on online or to teach and learn remotely? So uh, questions for, for any of you who would like to, to answer. Don, maybe you can start. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, I'm one of those that believes that you you play the way you practice, whether it's teaching or whether it's the guitar or whether it's football. Um, and I think our training for faculty needs to be online. In other words, you train online faculty with an online training program. That's how you allow them to learn the different aspects of the actual actual training. So I, that, that's one of the things I really strongly believe in. Um, <clears throat> it sort of links to the question earlier about, you know, what can leaders do once they decide they want to transform their organization? The first thing I usually tell leaders is remember that the most important resource you have in your organization is the faculty. And they can bring any initiative right to its knees anytime they want if they're not a board. So I, again, I think it's giving the faculty uh, the tools that they need, uh, the training that they need, um, and, at the, and yet at the same time, having enough empathy to respect what they do for a living. I think a lot of time advocates run into faculty members' offices and tell them to jump aboard, Technology is going to make your life so wonderful, but we really don't talk to them in ways that really relate to what they do for a living. They have to research and they're listening to us tell them, you know, go digital. Uh, I just think we need to really keep in mind that, that uh, our faculty really make our programs. We don't take good care of them. Students don't get good programs. If we don't take good care of them, we can't roll out new programs when we want to. So I, I really think that's a critical, critical issue. And training, of course, is part of that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, Don. But uh, at the moment, we are faced uh, that we have to do something. And if we didn't go to any training or institution didn't organize any training so far, we have to find out how and from where. And I can tell you from my point of view, um, for example, um, I'm working at the e-learning center for higher education institutions. So basically this is the place where you can start asking uh, questions. How do I get some training or some, how do I get some materials? And uh, definitely you will get something out of it. Maybe not everything you need, but this is a good starting uh, point of view. Um, okay, maybe Lisa, could you add something uh, to this topic? Yeah, I have to just reinforce what Don said about, you know, you learn the most when you're actually doing it. So you need to take an online course if you want to really learn um, what it's like to be a student. Uh, but there are a lot of programs out there. Um, the program that we offer through the University of Oldenburg is one, one of those programs with our management of technology enhanced learning. Uh, but there's, you know, there's but that's, there's lots of resources out there in addition to that. There's things like uh, the videos, for example, from Dave Cormier on, uh, on, on how to get online quickly. Um, one of the uh, really good examples that, that I read just this week was from Brian Lamb, who talked about his experience you know, working in the trenches of being a, a faculty techno ed educational technologist, trying to bring his faculty on board. And one of the things that he did was identify the faculty Avengers within his organization. And then he called on them to support people within 
uh, within his institution. And I think that's something that that everyone can do is is identifying who are the people within my organization that can support us during this time, uh, because there are a lot of people who have this experience, and perhaps people are just not aware of what that experience, uh, who those people are, and what it, that experience is. So I think it's really important to identify who those people are, and then to call on them to to do things like webinars and 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 uh, different types of uh, activities to to support uh, the individuals who are moving into online. Yeah, I agree with you, Lisa. This is why Eden is here, so that through our communication channels, through our community, we also share our knowledge and experience to help all of you uh, start uh, with online or to uh, advance uh, with online. We have one question saying, how can we find and engage volunteers to help with online courses? So maybe Antonella, could you try to answer this question? It's interesting. Volunteers. Who are the volunteers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is a is a is a good question. Um, you know, in in my experience, I can tell you that um, um, in a in a peer to peer view, uh, we can involve senior students, uh, and senior students can work as uh, uh, tutors and volunteers uh, to support teachers, to support the community, to support the group in a very, very practical way. Um, I can tell and maybe many others can share my, my situation because it's always uh, uh, difficult, especially in this time of crisis, to involve uh, the higher levels to involve the the governance to have support from the governance uh, in a very quick and immediate uh, uh, way. Even if um, in we we had a, a quick uh, uh, response from from the government, but if you have to move as we did with, especially with the postgraduate courses uh, online from, from one day to the other, you need to, to find a solution immediately. And I realized that senior students uh, can play a very important role because they think they are part of, of a group. They think they their action can have an impact. They, they feel useful. And so it's, it's good to involve them uh, and to in this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, ideal situation where they 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 can start helping uh, the community. Yeah, I agree with you, Antonella. I always say to teachers uh, take advantage of the students uh, and their knowledge of technology uh, because now uh, they can help you uh, in prepare preparation of uh, a teaching with the. The, all the tools they use already and maybe they're much more acquainted uh, uh, with this. Okay, uh, let's move to uh, another uh, question. I'm just having some problems with my computer uh, getting to, to questions. Um, so uh, we are moving now from instructional design to online assessment. Um, how can we organize trustful and credible examination in an online environment where we can ensure students are not cheating? And do we have some tips for preparation of online exams? Um, I know we will uh, devote much more time uh, on this issue uh, in our next webinar next Monday. But uh, for the present, uh, I would definitely like to share at least, at least some tips uh, regarding the online assessment. So, um, Lisa, maybe you can start. Yeah, I think one of the uh, biggest reasons that students cheat uh, online uh, in online environments uh, is because they run out of time. That we're giving, we're not giving them enough time to complete assignments. They're under a lot of pressure. Uh, they aren't able to complete the work that they need to uh, within the time allotted. So, I think it's important uh, as faculty to be flexible with your students to allow them to submit their assignments later uh, in, in uh, over time. 
one of the current trends that I personally really uh, support or believe in is the ungrading of assessments. That means only grading the really important assessments toward the end of the uh, toward the end of the um, of, of the course, and focusing really on formative assessment throughout the throughout the course. Uh, meaning, you you give them certain learning activities that that are defined. Uh, based on what your learning outcomes that you want to achieve through the course and then work toward those, providing them this formative feedback and giving them, for example, uh, no grade or pass-fail grade. Uh, one of the people that's written quite extensively about this is, Jess, uh, is Jesse Stommel, um, and uh, Maha Bali has also uh, published some, some work on this. Um, and it's really, it takes the pressure off of the student and it gives them more motivation to do the work um, because it gives them a, a sense of being more responsible for the work that they're doing. So I personally push the ungrading and, and allowing students to develop that, that, uh, that have that formative experience. Self-assessment is also um, a key part of that. Um, I've, I've done this throughout the past, uh, giving students an opportunity to grade themselves, you know, the, where they say, um, Rank your participation. I'll give them a rubric or I'll ask them to define their own rubric. How would they assess their own participation? How would they assess their uh, the work that they've done within the classroom? And I would say that in almost all cases, students did a really accurate representation of, of what kind of grade I would have given them. And oftentimes they give themselves a, a lesser grade than, than what I would have given them. So um, I think the cheating thing is... It's, it's going to be an issue in whatever classroom you're in, whether it's a traditional face-to-face -face classroom or whether it's a, it's an online classroom. Um, try to make your, your uh, assessments, the, the, how you assess the students' work, uh, to be unique. Don't, don't, don't give them an opportunity to uh, have a, an activity or a, a certain um, uh, assessment that, that they can just take off of the internet or have somebody else do for them. Um, make it unique for them and make that make that assessment really uh, important and relevant for them. That's what that's what my advice would be. Thank you, Lisa. Easier said than done, actually. But uh, yeah, definitely. This is what I'm saying to teachers as well. Don, would you add uh, something to the online assessment? Because it has become crucial uh, at this moment, because uh, if you look at the high location, we are in the middle of the semester and uh, uh, lots of teachers need to do some colloquials or even uh, provide uh, exams and uh, they have moved from face-to-face -face environment to the online environment and suddenly they have to do tests and online assessment. Yeah, I guess I guess the one I would just point out and, and is, is for teachers to uh, uh, look at it as a, a continuum and look at alternative assessment. Um, I have students even at the doctoral level who learn better one way than the other on the same kind of content that I'm teaching them. I've also had high school kids that have the same thing. And so is that directly related to cheating? No, but I think sometimes if we can align uh, some other options for assessment that get out the, that get at those same outcomes, um, I, I think we begin to to uh, offer other options. It does, it's not gonna solve the problem completely, but I, I think that's a general area that we're often restricted from doing because of resources. I understand that, and time. I started with time tonight when we talked. Uh, yeah, that keeps us from doing all those things, but uh, I, I sort of like that. I like it when I've got a student who I can see is not, not learning, the right, you know, but if I give them another context to think about the same material, they can demonstrate to me that they know it and do it. So it's an indirect way to get at the cheating issue. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm stop there. yeah we have a very good question uh, here. Do you think the mental situation of students are ready for exam in this pandemic time? So what do you think? Can you repeat the question? Uh, it's the mental situation of the students. So how, how students are prepared mentally for, for examination in this pandemic time. We have to take into account that um, they are at home, are working um, uh, by themselves mostly, 
uh, deciding how much time they will devote to, to, to learning. Um, they are maybe not so, uh, it, it's in, not in their nature maybe that they ask for online, maybe they prefer much more, you know, uh, practical issues or something in there. So uh, how, how mentally they are prepared for online exams? Well, let, yeah, I, I would invite Lisa and Antonella to jump on this. All I'll say on that is, we need to throw out the current schedule completely. Okay, what we're trying to do between now and June, um, and think about what's on people's minds. And people are stressed going through this whole process with the pandemic and everything. And I think we just need to lighten up a little bit. As I've said to Lisa, scale our speed dial from five down to one and just say, okay, chill. I'd rather have my students learn three good things in the next three months than trying to jam 20 things into them because lesson plans say we're supposed to do that. So I, I think we just need to step back for a moment, put, our you know, put ourselves in the shoes of our students and teachers who are trying to do this and give them a break. Give them time, give them support. Um, it won't, we won't do it perfectly. But that's okay. Yeah. Uh, what's impressive has been that we've responded. I think that's something this profession can celebrate for a long time to come. Yeah, I think I think at the moment it's very important to make sure that to keep them, to make them be present and online, uh, so uh, to take care of them. Uh, next question we have, I think, Antonella, I, I, maybe you can share your view on online assessment, but uh, with this question, how can you as a teacher rate how much time the student needs for a task? Well, we even don't know how other and how much other online classes and tasks they have. We um, we uh, went don't have uh, official spe uh, official schedule of, of online classes. Ah, we even do not have official schedule of online classes on faculty. So how to measure how much is appropriate uh, for students to, to work on uh, within one class? Uh, I know that teachers are sometimes very, uh, um, I would say, uh, very uh, happy to do a lot with students, but sometimes they exaggerate and do a little bit <laughs> too more, too much than it's possible, than it's needed. It's not the only class that students have. So how, how to measure? How to measure? Is it enough or not enough uh, for them? Uh, uh, this is a very good question because uh, what we are um, uh, noticing uh, with uh, with teachers, uh, I, of course, uh, is uh, uh, this idea of uh, of transferring. Uh, you know what you normally do in in class, face to face, uh, to a, an online setting, and that's the first mistake we could all do. So we can't think that one hour in class, face to face, is the same as one hour online. Uh, it's absolutely uh, impossible. A colleague uh, of mine uh, put on on Facebook as a joke a picture of you know uh, a computer uh, with a stick where the the, the 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 photo, the picture of the students was hung in front of the screen just to say that he was there, but he wasn't, of course. So we need to engage students. Uh, as what I was saying before, mm, involving uh, them in activities that they can carry out uh, and this idea of being part of a team um, can help uh, measuring also the time that we need to, to use for uh, and employ uh, for our students online. Uh, if I could give a measure, uh, but it's, it's difficult because, I mean, you, you, it depends on the objectives of your, of your, of your uh, lecture. Uh, so the tasks should be um, balanced, uh, taking into consideration what are your teaching and learning objectives and what you want your students to, to learn, to manage. Uh, so, of course, one hour is not equal, one hour face-to-face -face is not equal to one hour online. Uh, 
um, you can give small peers of, of lecturing in the traditional way and then ask students to do something. Uh, so very practical activities, as we were mentioning with tinkering or other kind of activities where they are directly involved. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Antonella. Let's move to uh, another question uh, from uh, our panel. Uh, so the next question, the next topic uh, we uh, chose is teaching. So how can we avoid overwork and burnout? Uh, we are working all day and have classes all day. Uh, we even get my emails at midnight. How to organize class in an online environment and how can we avoid just passing information to students via online lecture and available learning materials? What we have at the present uh, is that some of teachers who didn't uh, do anything uh, online before are actually doing emergency remote teaching and trying to find the way how to conclude this uh, school or academic year. So uh, we have already tackled uh, some of the issues related to teachers regarding uh, tutors, regarding uh, their uh, training, volunteers and so on. So uh, Don, let's start with you how to organize online class and make it a good quality class, not just teaching uh, remotely, face-to-face, uh, -face, usually face-to-face -face, uh, teaching. Um, well, interesting, the basic design, um, uh, Antonella and Elisa both alluded to this earlier, um, are very important components. Uh, for example, um, do you do week to week? in terms of your content. Or another option is maybe you go um, use a module approach that takes three weeks. Um, <clears throat> I've used both, they both can work. Um, it requires careful selection of content. Um, I place a high premium on interactive discussions. So I think interaction from the very beginning when I'm trying to get um, organize my classes um, <clears throat> um, because research supports better and deeper learning happen when people engage and interact. If we go back to Anderson and Archer and uh, the community of inquiry theory and social teacher and cognitive presence, um, for a while there we were saying, well, teacher presence really isn't, um, isn't that important. I disagree with that. I, I have found, in fact, even among older adults, they want you there. It's almost like uh, when your young child says, oh, you don't have to come, mom. It's okay if you're not there. Well, yeah, it is. They want you there. And, and I think our students are like that sometimes. They want to know, know you're in the building, okay? Um, I, I think people need to hear this clearly. To be good online takes time. There's no easy way around it. It takes time. Um, I probably spend at the master's and doctoral level two to three hours a day. Two to three hours a day interacting primarily with my students, doing other things too. But um, I, you know, I think I, I think in the current in the current situation, we, again, we're back to that immediate response. But in the long term, I, I would certainly encourage faculty and teachers to remember: it's like anything; you got to put the time in. Um, there's still a lot of teachers and faculty who think, you know, 20 minutes a week—that's that'll do it. No, uh, that's I think that's uh, Lisa's distinction earlier between remote learning and online learning. It's, it's quite different. So again, uh, everybody's a little bit different, but you know, I, again, I go into my classes, I want my students engaged. And if they feel like I care about them, they're gonna be engaged. Um, and they're gonna interact and they're going to, uh, uh, you know, I think enjoy the class more and learn better. I'll stop. 
Thank you, Don. I agree with you uh, to engage uh, students. Uh, it's not easy always to do. We have a question um, that uh, teachers uh, enable quizzes for students to do some self-evaluation, uh, but if it's not uh, compulsory, they are not so eager to do it. So, uh, Lisa, um, in, in uh, commenting on this topic and also on, on this question, uh, how about teaching uh, in online environment, how to uh, engage students? I think, as Don was mentioning before, teacher presence is really important. Um, I've often had the situation where, where students will want to engage with me because they want to be hearing the feedback from the teacher. What does the teacher think about this subject? Um, you know, am I on the right track? As a way of affirmation about what it is, they're, the way they're thinking, the way they're carrying out certain tasks. Uh, but what I think is also important is that they also have an opportunity to engage with, with each other. If you are only interacting one-on-one -on -one with your students, you're going to burn out, especially if you have a classroom full of, full of students. If you've got anything over 50 students, you won't be able to do the one-on-one -on -one interaction with the students for the most part. Um, so my advice in those kinds of cases is to really focus on what are the key points? Again, what are the learning outcomes that you want to achieve? How am I going to achieve them? What kinds of learning activities will I define in order to support my students in achieving those specific outcomes? What kinds of discussion questions will I have within my classroom environment that students can reflect upon, debate, discuss within the online classroom um, that will help them to gain the knowledge that we want them to acquire? What knowledge can they contribute from their own experiences? It's really important that we make the, the teaching relevant to our students too on how that applies to their specific context. And so I think um, as, a, as an instructor, it's really important that, that you, in order that you don't burn out, is that you also use the community of inquiry from the content perspective, the content, uh, the social presence, and the the, um, the student presence, and and really maximize that, uh, in order to you know to make sure the students are engaged. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. But let's uh, remind ourselves that we have interaction between um, students uh, and the content, uh, students with students, and students with teachers. So let's use all of these, these possibilities for interaction. Uh, it doesn't have to be only student teacher all the time. So uh, let's uh, use advantages of uh, other possibilities. Um, if, we, if we move to uh, uh, another topic, uh, I, I have very good questions, but I would start first with this uh, topic. We have chosen an easy student engagement. And how to, we have already opened this topic uh, about best, how to best engage and student, uh, sustain student involvement. And what about a big group of students, about 400 of them? How can we engage them? And this is the question I already uh, had when you have 400 students, how to work with such a big groups. And uh, I'm quite aware that in Croatia we have quite a big number of courses uh, with even more students than 400 when we have 700 students or 1,000 students, especially in the first years of, of, the, uh, of the faculty where you have joined the classes uh, for all the uh, studies on, on the one uh, course. So uh, student engagement, uh, working in small groups is, is it's better, but uh, what about Antonella working in a big group of students? Can you provide your uh, experience and, and ideas how to deal with this? I, I'll try. Uh, actually, as you as you said, uh, in Italy and in my department in particular, we have the same situation that you that you have in Croatia. So we have large large uh, numbers of uh, of students, uh, and uh, it uh, might be uh, difficult to to organize uh, um, uh, work and engage. Uh, them uh, very uh, uh, lively. Uh, actually, the solution is in finding a meaningful uh, um, individual or uh, group goal uh, to achieve. Uh, 
we need to negotiate uh, the goal with our students and find a goal in our activities that can have uh, an impact uh, in the outside world so that they feel that they can be uh, helpful uh, to uh, the community and also the society where, where they are based. Um, of course, as we, we said, we need to be present and to give um, feedback, continuous feedback, in order to uh, keep them uh, involved. Um, in, in my uh, experience, I can tell you that in different uh, uh, occasions, with large classes, uh, more than 100 uh, students, especially um, in training primary school uh, teachers, those are our, our uh, students uh, in the master uh, classes, uh, we, for instance, started uh, um, to make them work on digital storytelling uh, regarding, uh, in particular, um, some work uh, of arts. We managed in organizing groups in Moodle uh, and we assigned them these tasks, um, making them work on narration and also on, on storytelling using wikis, for instance. And they uh, used spontaneously also Skype and WhatsApp to compare their ideas. So they felt they were so much involved and that they could uh, be part of something that was going to be used, to be used in, in real contexts so because they uh, their their products uh, were then um, you know part of a larger uh, project and could be used in 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 uh, uh, the development of uh, technological um, tools for uh, museum uh, education. So knowing that there was a, a, a shared a, a, a goal that had an impact also outside made the uh, goal uh, real, uh, they felt they were useful and so they participated and we uh, reached the, the end of, uh, uh, of uh, the activity very successfully, not missing any, uh, anyone. Uh, so the key word is uh, uh, to find a meaningful goal, to find uh, a motivating goal, to find a goal that has an impact outside the context of university and to give uh, uh, feedback, that, that's for sure to have a, a continuous feedback, maybe through senior, as we were saying, through senior students uh, that can help and be part of the groups and, you know, supervise the groups together with the teachers in order to avoid the burnout, as we were mentioning before. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Antonella. Uh, Don, um, I'm moving to you with the same question, but I would like you to add your view how open educational resources can be used uh, as, a, as a way to uh, empower teacher, uh, students' uh, involvement uh, uh, in the class, online class? Well, <clears throat> I guess my first comment is, is, is the three words that academics don't like to say, and that is, I don't know. Uh, in, in the large, large classes, you know, this isn't just an online issue, you know. We've got universities with first-year students taking classes wow. of a 1,000 students. Now the idea or sort of the, uh, the mantra is, well, we've got more students, so the university will be able to hire more tutors so that you can do more interactive activities. The problem that occurs is those people never get hired because resources get diverted in, in, in other directions. So it's an increasing challenge. I think uh, there's no perfect way to do that um, when you get into those kinds of numbers. Um, I think we need, to will, we need to be willing to accept that 
you know, you can do a lot better job with 20 students than you can with 500. That's just the way it is for the most part because we don't have the resources to hire additional people to do some of those things. In some cases, maybe we get a few tutors that we can do some things with, whether they be small group kinds of activities or those kinds of things. But it's an ongoing challenge. It, it's the one that makes me chuckle every time I see a MOOC with 22,000 students enrolled. You know, it's okay, great. Took us 30 years to do research that said interaction and engagement were important and things that we're out there advocating for are violating those very basic um, pieces of research that we are, you know, on Monday advocating for. How could OERs help that? Well, I think OERs can help in the sense that it can bring down costs. Does it give students easier access or does it make it more engaging? If you're using the resources or the OERs as part of the course, it's part of the content. It's very difficult to, to change the dynamics of interaction, um, at least in my view, um, you know, because it would be it would form part of whatever you were planning to do in terms of your interactive strategies anyway. Um, in the Masters of uh, Education program at Oldenburg University that I work on with Lisa, our classes are designed entirely with OERs. Um, and it's great because we don't have to go through, you know, all the copyright approvals. You know, most of the content is uh, a Creative Commons licensed uh, with attribution and, you know, usually no derivatives. We can't change it, but we can distribute it and use it. So it gives us certainly the opportunity to use those materials broader among 500 people. Does it increase interaction? I don't know. That's my honest answer. I don't know. So thank you, Don. Um, very, very good answer. Yes, we do not need to know all the answers. Uh, if there are no always the, 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 the one answer uh, the, or the unique answer, uh, every experience is different, every subject is different, every environment is different, so every, every group of students is different. So it's always some way how to adapt already what is used somewhere to your needs uh, and, and see how it fits uh, uh, into your teaching, uh, teaching classes. So um, let's move. Uh, let's move with the, the, the last topic we have uh, here uh, with uh, us, and uh, uh, we already uh, talked about it. So we are just as continuation collaborative group work. Yes or no? And if yes, how do you organize group work online so the students are motivated and truly collaborate together? And do we have the guidelines for online collaborative work group? And I'm going, going to give floor to Lisa to open uh, this topic. So Lisa, please. Thank you, Sandra. Um, yes, I think there should be good, uh, there should be group work, but it has to be well organized. Any kind of group work that you have, whether it's face to face or in an online environment, it's going to be challenging. You're always going to have someone that uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't carry their weight. You're always going to have situations where perhaps ev not everyone understands what the, what the uh, group uh, activity is supposed to be. So there needs to be, um, more time, I think, within an online environment to allow the group dynamic to develop. Um, and in order to realize that, you're going to have to have things like clear instructions, you're going to have to have a scaffolding of the activities, you're going to have to have moderating of, of, of the groups. Um, it's going to be very important that you provide them feedback as they move along towards whatever the goal is. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be the feedback from the instructor. You can have mentors, you can have teaching assistants provide that kind of feedback. Um, especially in, cor in courses where there's a, a large number of students, um, it's it's very important that you give the students autonomy to make decisions. The the group work needs to be also relevant. It can't just be uh, well. We need to have group work. What can we have as a group activity within our class? Um, it needs to be aligned with whatever your learning uh, desired learning outcomes are. What do you want to achieve uh, for this class, and how can I? Um, how can I achieve it through a group activity? And I'll give you an example from one of the courses that, that we teach in, at, at 
in our program. Um, and that's on the histories, the principles and the theories of, of technology enhanced learning and, and on distance education. And what we do is we ask the students to think about context in terms of the history of, of distance education and e-learning. And they do that as a group. And so they contribute different aspects of that into a table and they build this table over different waves of development. It's not something that one student would be able to do on their own because they're bringing that together from a number of different sources. And this grid that they create is then something that gives them at the end of the project um, really an overview of all of the different contextual factors that have influenced the development of technology, enhanced learning and online learning over time. And these are things like, um, um, you know, social and political and economic movements at the moment, that would be the pandemic that we're currently experiencing now, um, technology developments, uh, new theories that are development that are developed, uh, new authors that have, uh, have contributed to the field, uh, different models, different institutional models of, of online and distance learning. And this is an example of how uh, what we've done is said, okay, we want to have a group activity. And when everyone contributes, it creates something that's even bigger than if one person had done it. But in order to do that, you need to have groups that have, as I said before, clear instructions, have scaffolding, have formative feedback throughout the process from a mentor, from the instructor, um, and it, you need to be flexible and allow them to have the time to form their group and to achieve the activities that they need to achieve uh, during the time frame. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Uh, yeah, very good point. Uh, Antonella, would you continue uh, to add something to, the, to this? Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, because uh, we um, we have different strategies that we can employ in in group work uh, that can be useful and successful. Uh, we need to understand that besides the the, the, the emergency, which is stressing certain aspects, uh, um, for sure. Uh, we we have uh, the, the duty to help our our students, our our pupils to develop uh, uh, certain skills. As I was mentioning before, that are strictly connected to uh, to group work and to the skills that are enhanced in in group uh, um, work. Um, there are strategies I was mentioning. There are, for instance, uh, uh, two kind of uh, of strategies that we can employ in uh, in uh, group work. One is the jigsaw method, um, which can be very effective. Uh, in this method, um, uh, you can help uh, students uh, um, acquire uh, knowledge through collaborators collaboration and constructivist uh, strategy. Um, students, what, do, what are they asked to do? They need to uh, develop, to be instructed to work on a specific, uh, a very specific uh, piece uh, uh, of knowledge. Uh, and when they uh, are faced uh, together, are um, together, each of them uh, present their own study, their own development on a specific part of, uh, of the topic the teacher um, uh, facilitated. In this way, we have different little uh, experts in one part of uh, the, the, the old picture and the old picture comes uh, together in the end. This way, uh, this is a very uh, effective uh, uh, way of uh, enhancing uh, group work and you know engaging students uh, uh, in their in their duties. Um, the other um, strategy is role playing. Uh, role taking uh, strategy uh, is again uh, another method that can be very uh, effective. Uh, we have been working with role playing in different uh, um, situations, um, and it proved to be very, very effective. Uh, you all know how how it works, but it's it's useful, especially to develop those skills that are very much needed 
uh, in uh, in uh, the workplace and in particular after the the, um, the COVID emergency. Um, collaborative learning is is the key, as we were mentioning before, and there are different uh, uh, opportunities to learn more about collaborative uh, learning. Um, there are different projects. We have a project on open virtual mobility that is based uh, on different kind of skills to be developed. And there are open resources there. So if you want, we can give uh, uh, the link again to, to the courses. So the opportunities uh, online are really wide. There are lots of them. We need to find a way to identify the right ones and the ones that every one of us needs uh, uh, for their own their own uh, um, scopes. Thank you, thank you, Antonella. I think we have um, come to the end of uh, our our meeting. Uh, it has been ninety minutes already that we are uh, all here. Uh, we have to finish. Um, I uh, wish to thank all my panelists for, for time and willingness to share the expertise and knowledge in how to organize online learning uh, in these times. Uh, it's not a normal situation that sometimes someone decides to do online learning and have the time to think about it and to do it. We have different times uh, and not actually having the time to, to do that. Uh, I would like to announce our next webinar, uh, which is going to be on Monday, as we are always on Monday, especially exceptionally this is Tuesday because of the Easter. So next Monday at 5 uh, 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 Central Eastern Time, we will have a webinar on how to use online assessment to uh, improve uh, learning. Please join us. Um, but also I will... Um, share uh, with you that the EDEM conference is going on this year as well. We are going virtual. Uh, time for apply for, for a presentation uh, uh, and paper is still open. We have to the end of the April. So please join us virtually, participate virtually at EDEM conference and share your knowledge and expertise. Um, I, I got very one very nice uh, a question about giving some videos for students. Uh, you gave me uh, uh, something to think about with uh, my team, how to provide as well some information for students. We will think about that. Uh, I wish to thank you all for being with us today, for doing 90 minutes. Uh, recording will be available, so stay tuned. Thanks to all of you, and especially thanks to my panelists. Don, Lisa, and Antonella. Bye, everyone. Thanks to you. Uh, Sandra, may I say something regarding yeah. the NAP? Because the Network of Academics and Professionals uh, used to offer uh, other webinars uh, on different subjects uh, and topics. Uh, and, of course, we had to, to stop for a while. But from uh, April 22nd, we should be again online with our webinars so stay tuned and have a look at our uh, website at the, at the Eden website for more communication regarding that thank you sorry for that. thank you thank you thank you all see you next monday bye